The UN, Israel Palestine, and 9 11 Scholarship. A discussion with UN Special Rapporteur Richard Falk. January 30th, 2011. Of course, one hopes to reach uh, the fair minded people that hopefully are the majority. Uh, one can never get to uh, persuade the most zealous. Uh, critics, because they don't care about the reality or the truthfulness. They're, they have an agenda, and their agenda involves uh, being very uh, prepared to engage in character assassination if that's the way to advance that agenda. Dr. Richard Falk is Professor Emeritus of International Law at Princeton University. He is the author, co-author, or editor of about three dozen scholarly books. In 2008, Professor Falk was appointed to a six-year term as Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights in the Palestinian Territories, occupied since 1967. Professor Falk has been attacked recently by UN Watch, by UN General Secretary Ban Ki-moon, and by the US Ambassador to the UN, Susan Rice. In this discussion, Professor Falk gives his assessment of the political context of the criticisms he is facing for identifying Israeli crimes in the treatment of Palestinians in Gaza and the West Bank, and for referring positively to the scholarly contributions of Professor David Ray Griffin and other academics who have identified serious shortcomings in government and mainstream media interpretations concerning the contested events of 9-11. Uh, uh, do you think the Secretary General of the United Nations, Ban Ki-moon, has done his homework sufficiently to be able to make the kind of judgments and assessments he has of your work? Well, my own uh, effort to uh, find out what under uh, what was beneath his uh, allegations was a concern that the UN not be uh, accused of being uh, critical of Israel or anti-Israeli. And this has a certain political sensitivity for him at this moment because his own term of office expires in a year. And he's interested in a second term. Yes, and, and how would he go about securing uh, political support for his second term? Well, I think he, I, my sense from having talked with other people is that, he, that the concern is more that he is trying to deflect uh, criticism of the UN and of himself uh, that has been mounted by the new Republican uh, control of Congress, and that it's a re reaction to the U.S. Congress. Yes. Frankly, I would look to the United Nations as a place where there would be an especially uh, important imperative to get to the bottom of what happened on 9-11, because 9-11 has been used to justify wars, which clearly are illegal, which violate uh, the rule of law as people have tried to develop it uh, at the United Nations since uh, the Second World War, that uh, there, there are so much uh, consequential changes took place in global geopolitics based on a kind of unsatisfactory assessment of, 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 of the evidence of what happened on 9-11 that Ban Ki-moon could really be criticized, that the UN is, should be a, a place where we would want to get at truths, that where we would want to be on top of, for instance, scholarly literature, academic literature on important um, topics, as you are on top of the literature, and as it seems to me, uh, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon is not. Well, I think you have to understand that the UN is uh, at bottom a geopolitical actor that is very, uh, tends to be very deferential to its major members. And this is not new with the current Secretary General. It's been characteristic of its own, 
whole history, and it points to a weakness of the UN that its funding is dependent on uh, the contributions from its uh, leading members. It, the uh, of the Secretary General is subject to the uh, veto of the five permanent members, and there's every indication that uh, ever since the organization began, it was less interested, the, the members were less interested in carrying out the goals of the UN Charter and upholding the rule of law that I think made meant much of the public very supportive of the UN than it was in providing an instrument to uh, leading governments to pursue their main foreign policy goals. So it's not surprising to me that you don't find that kind of critical role being played by the UN. I think it has to be played by civil society and by uh, one of the things that people who are uh, in universities and can engage in critical thinking, I think they can fill that vacuum uh, that uh, does exist and leaves questions uh, such as uh, closing the gaps uh, relating to uh, the 9-11 uh, experience, leaving those gaps uh, open and subject then to the suspicion that has emerged over the period of 10 years. Yes, of course, this is uh, so disappointing to, to, to my way of thinking, your treatment uh, by the Secretary General of the United Nations and, and those uh, who uh, seem to give support for his position is, a, is indicative of the dilemma of the United Nations, the sort of uh, failure of the United Nations to live up to the kind of idealistic hopes of, it, of its founders and to respect uh, the, this very uh, lofty kind of language in its charter. Uh, so even when uh, civil society, even when esteemed professors like Professor David Ray Griffin at Claremont Graduate University, who's written 10 books on the subject of 9-11, of his 37 books, the last 10 have been on 9-11. And obviously, as you know, his reputation is uh, very solid. Um, it's a, as, your, as your reputation, you, you these, you are individuals who embody and epitomize, you know, the dedication of, of the professoriate to the higher calling of identifying truth, even when it's inexpedient to power. So to my way of thinking, we're at a moment here where things crystallize in a way that we, we why should we have any confidence in, in the United Nations if, if its officials can't deal with what is coming out of the academy, the work of many professors, not only Professor David Ray Gribben, who, who, who have unfolded, uh, who have demonstrated that the official account of what happened just doesn't, isn't supportable by the evidence. I, I think it's uh, correct what you say, but it's important at the same time to realize that the UN, despite these failings, has an enormous importance in uh, clarifying the legitimacy of uh, certain claims of people that are living under oppression uh, are deprived of their basic human rights. And in that sense, one needs to recognize that the UN remains very important in the conduct of what I call legitimacy wars. The, the UN played a very constructive role in the anti-apartheid movement that brought to an end the racist regime in South Africa. I think it's playing an important role in the Palestinian struggle, even though it can't do very much behaviorally to assist the Palestinians and to rescue them from the conditions under which they've been living now for decades, very cruel and uh, abusive conditions. But what it can do, and it shouldn't be uh, overlooked, is it can uh, validate the efforts in civil society uh, to 
wage a nonviolent but coercive struggle that now centers on uh, in initiatives such as the boycott, divestment, and sanctions effort that proved so successful in relation to South Africa, and also to try to break the blockade of Gaza through the Free Gaza Movement and the Freedom Flotilla, enormously effective as challenging what governments and the UN have been unable to do. So in that sense, one needs the UN is a source of symbolic uh, support in the conduct of legitimacy wars that uh, really were so successful in uh, defeating the colonial system, for instance, in the 1960s and 1970s, where in almost every occasion, the weaker side militarily prevailed politically. And one needs to think about the UN in that second sense, not in the first sense of peacekeeping and the kind of expectations that many people had uh, based on the idea that it was a war prevention uh, institution. It has failed in that first primary uh, undertaking, but it has not failed the secondary role. For instance, in relation again to the Israel-Palestine conflict, it was able to commission the Goldstone uh, mission of inquiry that definitely uh, cast uh, a definitive doubt on the Israeli claims that they were entitled to attack Gaza in the way they did two years ago, and that they carried out that attack in accordance with international humanitarian law. But what they haven't been able to, what the UN cannot do, is implement the recommendations of the Goldstone Report. They can create the understanding of the illegality and the criminality of the policies, but they can't take that next step of implementing those recommendations. Of course, that's the weakness of the UN in a sense that there's no enforcement mechanism. Laws exactly. can be passed, exactly. uh, findings can be made that laws have been breached, but then there's no uh, ability to follow through, or rarely does it happen, uh, that we see anything other than um, victor's justice in, in, in different uh, types of efforts to clarify the, the, the rule of law of the United Nations. It's always victor's justice. Yeah, but that, that uh, presupposes that intergovernmental behavior is the only way to implement law. And see, so what I'm trying to say is that civil society and the struggles of people are what are making history, really as we speak, if you look at what's happening all over the Middle East, it's the changes are not being brought about by either the UN or by uh, governments. It's they're being brought about by the co collective actions of mobilized people. And in my view, that same dynamic is uh, re relevant for understanding the relationship of the UN to the Israel-Palestine conflict. It doesn't solve the problem, but what it does do is to create a, a platform of validation for civil society initiatives, for Palestinian struggle, for uh, persuading public opinion uh, that what the Palestinians are seeking is consistent with international law and international morality. So we have to hold both truths in our mind. The truth that the UN cannot implement, cannot enforce, and the second truth that it can contribute to a political process uh, that may create the kind of historical changes that the international law and international morality uh, require.
Professor Falk, you, you mentioned